My name is Nadim Khoury. I'm a human rights lawyer. And as you mentioned, I'm a member of the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. So the high level panel is an independent and diverse group of international lawyers and, and judges who come from different parts of the world with different experiences who were convened uh, starting in 2019 to provide advice and recommendations to state members of the Media Freedom Coalition. If, if you recall, the Media Freedom Coalition uh, is a large grouping of states that came together to promote and protect a vibrant uh, free press. And they asked us to uh, provide them advice and very specific recommendations to do so. And as part of our work, we've done a number of things. Uh, one of them is we've done a series of uh, in-depth uh, advisory reports that we uh, shared with the uh, state members who had asked us for the advice, but also that we publicly disseminated that focused on how can international mechanisms better protect a journalist. And uh, the reports, uh, so each one focused, one of them focused on the use of uh, targeted sanctions to protect journalists. Another one looked at uh, how to reform the system of emergency visas and simplify asylum procedures for a threatened journalist. The third one looked at uh, strengthening consular support uh, for journalists in detention, notably. And the last one, which I authored, looked at how can we promote more effective investigations into uh, abuses against uh, journalists. Now, in terms of I, I should say, as you mentioned, my area of expertise in terms of human rights investigations is uh, not solely, but particularly focused in the Middle East and North Africa. And I would say I also worked for a very long time on, on Syria. I was the human rights watch researcher and then director for uh, Syria for over a decade. During that time, I documented and conducted uh, you know, field investigations in Syria into all sorts of violations. Uh, including things like arbitrary arrest, torture, enforced disappearance, extrajudicial executions um, of activists, but also of, uh, of uh, journalists. And if there are specific, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. No, if there are specific aspects of recommendations or issues uh, that you would find relevant that you would like me to, to elaborate on now, um, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I'm actually, that's perfect because my, my next question before we go into challenges and, and lack of effective um, work on, on accountability, perhaps I wanted to see what kind of findings in Syria in relationship to, frankly, in the evolution we have covered in, during the first day today, um, what happened and how things shifted after 2011, March 2011, naturally. But in your investigations and research, could you speak a little bit about what happened in Syria and how that evolved towards the, the repression that, that we saw 2012 onwards? So I would start by saying, you know, uh, repression of, um, of journalists, activists, and frankly, freedom of expression in general was the norm in Syria for decades, uh, since the, uh, I would say the early 1980s um, and what was called at the time the Great Repression, journalists um, and it would regularly be arbitrarily detained, uh, often disappeared and jailed uh, for their activities. And um, in the 2000s, there was a bit of an opening, some courageous journalists, some people were trying to create a bit of a more of a space uh, for journalists to criticize, but this was very much an authoritarian regime with a very narrow space. In 2011, uh, when the Syrian uprising um, uh, erupted, and uh, we saw uh, courageous uh, journalists, but also uh, what I would call citizen journalists people who, because there was a very few independent journalists in the country, uh, they started to, you know, citizens started to document what's going on around them, to write. Some of them were bloggers. Some of them used videos that they would upload um, and to relay to the outside world what was happening in, in Syria. And what we saw was that the uh, Syrian regime uh, reacted uh, ferociously. Uh, any footage that was found, anyone publishing, anyone that they could find, uh, 
disseminating this information would often be detained, uh, disappeared. Uh, many died in detention. And I know one of the cases you're considering of Nabil Sharbaji, this is exactly what, uh, what happened. Uh, many would be uh, tortured, their uh, you know, cell phones, computers would be taken, information would be extracted, and uh, they uh, would not get uh, a fair trial. If they were the lucky ones would get maybe a military trial or a field court, but you know, the vast majority were simply detained by the security services without any trial. And um, you know, this, this continued. And as the, uh, as the situation in Syria evolved from one of repression of an uprising to a full-fledged war, we also saw the rise of armed groups that they in turn uh, often went out and detained, kidnapped, and tried to silence uh, journalists. Uh, the numbers of journalists that have been uh, killed in Syria over the last decade is very hard to come by. We have estimates. Uh, part of it is a question of definition of who you include as a journalist, uh, but also part of it is just simply due to the fact that so many have disappeared um, and so um, we still don't know their fate. I know that um, Reporters Sans Frontières had estimated at one point that more than 300 journalists Official and non-official had been killed in Syria over the last decade. Obviously, the vast majority of them uh, Syrian nationals, but also um, some Syrian groups think the number can be as high as 700 if you include uh, larger categories of, of citizen journalists that were really the eyes uh, and ears um, of international media during this uh, during the conflict. And Im, you just mentioned something that is being of um, actually has been a, a recurrent question throughout the day today. Was there any tensions? I mean, who are considered journalists, and what are those different categories? If you can just um, explain for us. Yeah, no, and I, I can understand where that tension comes from, but you have to understand in Syria there were no independent card-carrying journalists, right? The only uh, independent media outlets tended to be the um, state-sanctioned ones. Um, so at the beginning, you had many, um, you know, the blogs was a space for journalists, to, you know, or people to start expressing their ideas and to report on what is happening. So you'd have bloggers. And then you also had uh, people using social media, notably Facebook in the early years, as a platform for uh, dissemination. Uh, of actual reporting. So this was very much people acting as journalists um, and, and but using the tools that were available to them. We then saw the, the rise of uh, people using um, you know, their cell phones or cameras to, to photograph and film what's happening and disseminate those either directly in some cases, uh, either through uh, various, you know, the Syrians organized themselves into kind of um, I would say media cells, uh, usually by region, by area, so that they could cover uh, the repression and the war that was happening in their uh, areas. But often as, the, as things got more organized, many of them acted as uh, fixers, freelancers uh, for international uh, media or regional media. Because remember, very few journalists were allowed uh, into Syria to, uh, to report. And many of these uh, uh, journalists on the ground, uh, these, um, you know, they um, often they had, um, I would say, aliases because they had to protect their identity. Uh, but they very much were, uh, in my view, and by any definition of journalist, a a journalist. They were doing their journalistic duty, mission, and without them, we would not have known what was going on in Syria. Thank you. I should mention this is something that has come up in our work as a high level panel, one of the issues about how, who do we include as journalists and we um, purposely adopted a uh, broader definition, which looked at the uh, function of what was being done, the role of the person, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, if they were card carrying working for a media outlet on a full-time basis, which really is a minority. And this is not just limited to Syria. We see that in many of the new conflicts today in the world. 
Terrific. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, we're going to be going deep into into accountability or perhaps the lack of accountability. And perhaps the, the first question is, how does Syria, in presuming a, a very, very substantial lack of accountability, how does that compare and what are the technical, perhaps, obstacles and reasons, in your opinion, for to see that lack of accountability, while simultaneously we had Mass and Darwish with us before identifying efforts in different jurisdictions and some level of of coordinations, but still what we see is a very low quota of accountability. Could you go into those technical considerations before I ask if that's all right, more political considerations, Nadim? Sure. So I think that the first thing to note is that there is um, total impunity in Syria itself. Um, and this is impunity that is entrenched both in law and in practice. In law, because uh, Syrian laws actually, I mean, of course, they criminalize murder and, and kidnapping and so forth. But even in the law, um, members of the security forces uh, are shielded from prosecution if their superiors don't give the permission, which in practice never happens. So there's a de facto uh, impunity. And in addition, uh, I mean, and, and this is sort of an open secret, they never investigate their own crimes. I mean, if you look at the Caesar photos, even where it was very clear what was happening, there's never been any investigation. So what, what does that leave us and what have we seen in the last decade? Um, in terms of the uh, different potential avenues, um, due to the work of very courageous activists on the ground and also uh, lawyers and human rights organizations, there were many attempts to try to refer the situation in Syria to an international tribunal. That effort has so far been blocked because the Security Council has refused to refer it because Syria is shielded by Russia and China, which have used their vetoes to, to kind of promote this impunity, unfortunately. Um, and also, uh, Syria is not a member of the ICC. So those avenues have been closed. The only avenues that have been open has mostly been uh, national jurisdiction cases, you know, using uh, either for different forms of you know, either universal jurisdiction or other bases, mostly for foreign journalists who were killed or kidnapped in Syria. Uh, you know, like Remy Oshlik or Mary Colvin in the US or Remy Oshlik in France. Uh, so attempts to use uh, the link of uh, nationality in these home countries to uh, try to prosecute cases of, of foreign journalists who were killed in, uh, in Syria. And we've also seen um, some attempts, um, I would say they're a handful, we can talk a bit more about them because one of the issues is there are very few Syrian uh, perpetrators today in some of these jurisdictions, but where there have been, and they're being you know, uh, pursued for torture, things, uh, other things, if one of their victims is a journalist, that's one possible avenue. So that's a possible avenue, but it mostly uh, helps uh, foreign uh, journalists doesn't help the vast majority, which are Syrian journalists. Um, and it has shown its, um, its limitations. Um, and I'll give you a, a few examples. I mean, one of the main examples of its limitations um, is um, the fact that the uh, witnesses are often not able to travel, or even the victims in the case where, for instance, the journalist uh, was tortured but is surviving. And there have been cases that I was involved in where, um, let's say, these uh, survivals or these witnesses are sitting in refugee camps in uh, Turkey or in Lebanon, and there's an investigation taking place in a European jurisdiction. But, uh, you know, prosecutors want to send um, formal questions through the Turkish uh, police or through the Lebanese police, but these refugees tend to have very vulnerable legal situations. And they're often very worried about answering these questions, uh, attracting attention to them, either by the local law enforcement in Lebanon or Turkey or Jordan, or in um, the Syrian communities, which are often as well, um, you know, there might be informants and so forth. So that makes as well the uh, jurisdictional element harder. And this is why I think it's one of the issues is one of the obstacles is the uh, challenges and the need for more emergency visas and asylum procedures for threatened journalists and their families. Uh, we've seen, you know, um, 
civil society groups that have done a great mobilization, uh, but the needs are much higher. And sometimes uh, these these efforts, uh, you know, were hampered by formal definitions of who's a journalist and who's not a journalist and so forth. But the second uh, challenge has also been one of uh, evidentiary, uh, on an evidentiary basis, where there's been, um, you know, good documentation, but the documentation either gets lost, and we can maybe discuss this because I think this is one of the key recommendations. Uh, time has elapsed. Uh, you know, it's it's a difficult environment to to document, and there's a need to preserve the evidence with multiple. You know, there's a chain of custody of who's collecting the evidence, how it gets transmitted. So these are some of the challenges of the existing procedures. And the impact, unfortunately, has been that uh, the impunity uh, for the terrible attacks on journalists in Syria is simply rampant and overwhelming, even for very high profile journalists like uh, Mary Colvin. And then beyond the technical obstacles, I mean, Syria also has or represents today one of the international um, conflicts, understood conflicts, where more mechanisms have been put into place, from commissions of inquiry to the triple IM, which I'm not able to really spell it out, but I mean that commission from the United Nations, impartial and aiming, and yet uh, there is one of the lowest, again, um, rates of success, whatever success is measured when it comes to uh, accountability efforts. Do, do, you, do you care to evaluate that? Yeah, I mean, this is mostly, it's true that the uh, level of documentation of the abuses in Syria is very high. Um, that first started, um, you know, by NGO, civil society, and now there's obviously, there was used to be the UN Commission of Inquiry, which continues, and as you mentioned, the UN IIIM mechanism, and now they are collecting um, evidence, and there are other institutions like the, uh, you know, CJA and others have been collecting evidence. The problem is, so far, is um, there's no tribunal, there's no international tribunal this that the, all this evidence could feed into. Um, there are cases where if there is a uh, national jurisdiction that can assert, uh, you know, uh, its jurisdiction over a case because of universal jurisdiction and so forth, there will be collaboration. But those are few and far between because often uh, there's a requirement that the suspect be present on the territory of the country. And most of these cases tend to be, I would say, structural cases looking at, and, and these are very important, right? Uh, key officials who are in charge of vast networks and so forth. And so in practice, the evidence has been gathered, but there's no space for it to be really uh, used and exploited uh, in a way that actually leads to uh, um, to justice. So there is still a need to either one day refer Syria to the uh, International Criminal Court if the situation changes, or there is a need to uh, hopefully be creative. And given that it's a block to have an international tribunal through the Security Council, uh, there are some people proposing through the General Assembly. Uh, but these are, you know, uh, heavy, uh, you know, it's a heavy lift. And the political will these days seems to be uh, lacking for this. In the absence of this, I think that the uh, most immediate uh, avenue has been, uh, you know, uh, national jurisdictions in Europe that can assert some form of universal uh, jurisdiction. Um, but again, I think that's not enough given the scale of the uh, abuses that have happened. And I think so far, we haven't seen, I think that's why this initiative is so important, we haven't seen uh, real, um, you know, trials, particularly for Syrian journalists. We, there have been a couple of trials uh, for foreign journalists that have been ongoing, usually in absentia because the perpetrators are not, are not present or in custody. And now, if you allow me, uh, just a short introduction, but I just, I'm going to call for a speculation, so please feel free to tell me that you don't want to speculate on, on this. But we heard today, but well, the numbers when it comes to the Syria conflict are beyond my understanding. My brain can really not wrap around the numbers, including journalists, as, as Mr. Darwish was uh, throwing numbers today. We have, by the regime, over 700 attacks on, on with the result of the death of the journalist. And, 
and other numbers, and also we determined by listening to Paul Conroy and Edith Bobier, who are in the room with us, that it is really the, the Syria mark the very first time where they could see documents or see instructions or intelligence cables where the journalists were targeted. It were part of the of the policy. It was really a policy, I think, where Mr. Conroy's words. And could then, and then we also understood, apologies again for the introduction, but I wanted to put, to put all of these pieces together. We understood from last week's uh, Amarfier, Mrs. Amarfier's testimony that 52 countries are part of this media, media freedom coalition. So I guess my question that calls for uh, speculation is could this tribunal and the high level panel perhaps be, I know this is beyond their mandate, but be precursors in the context of the repression against journalists, potential platforms for these investigations or provide an opportunity for these investigations to be more effective or to have continuity or, or you know, perhaps more constant, yes, to, to establish eventually uh, some accountability. Well, thank you very much for this question, which I think is, is essential. So the uh, one of the recommendations of the high-level panel to the Media Freedom Coalition was to create a uh, multilateral uh, standing body uh, to investigate and to uh, attacks uh, on journalists and not to wait. Uh, and this would not just be for Syria, that this would be kind of a standing body that is international, that is not necessarily under UN auspices. It's really a coalition of the willing, so to speak, um, and of the committed that uh, come together and they create a body of investigators that can be deployed quickly to collect evidence when there are such attacks on, on journalists. Um, and I still think this would you know, help strengthen the evidentiary process and prepare these cases. We would still have face the problem of where is this evidence going to be used? In which jurisdiction? Uh, because uh, you know, right now we're still either have to go to a national jurisdiction or an international court, and uh, we, you know, a multilateral effort that doesn't go through the UN has there hasn't been really precedence to create such multilateral. Uh, courts willingly, but at least the evidence would be collected and could be um, could be used. So I think this would be important. I think there are other things that could be done by the Media Freedom Coalition to support these efforts. Uh, so I think uh, uh, one of them, and, and in particular in the case of, of Syria, a lot of the evidence of attacks on journalists is being collected usually by, uh, you know, first responders, local NGOs, uh, um, other forms of human rights activists on the ground. And they often are the ones that can actually have the, um, the evidence in their hands. It might be maybe the bullet or the direction where the shell came from or in the, uh, you know. And um, we've seen in other co contexts that um, the evidence they collect often may not uh, pass the test that courts would require regarding chain of custody and so forth. And so I think an investment by the Media Freedom Coalition to uh, train and strengthen and facilitate the process of turning this human rights documentation into evidence that can be used in courts, I think would be very helpful. I think there's also, we've also seen um, in, in, in recent years, uh, really the explosion of the use of uh, online intelligence. Uh, videos, footage, and we've seen uh, many groups, uh, human rights groups, but also groups like Bellingcat and others being able to conduct sometimes investigation, analyzing uh, footage, analyzing satellite imagery, uh, rec you know, analyzing um, cell phones um, and, and tracking where the person has gone to, 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 to actually collect such evidence. And I think this could also be important and, and should be facilitated uh, and the training made more available uh, in the context of Syria to, to collect this evidence. And in the context of the conflict in Syria, there are tens of thousands of hours of footage that's been collected. Uh, some of it has been analyzed, but not all of it. But I think that can really be an important uh, element in building up more cases for successful prosecution for attacks against journalists.
unless you want to add anything else, I don't have any more questions, but I will hand it to the panel. They will have a few questions for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. Thank you. I'll just ask offline, online, is there anybody speaking online? Otherwise, okay, to you, Eduardo. Hello, good afternoon, Nadine. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is related to the definition of journalists, and the other is regarding universal jurisdiction, that you, you touch both things. For the first one, we were discussing this, uh, the definition of journalism. Uh, I would like to, to, to hear your opinion because frankly, I'm not sure if when we are talking about impunity, attacks, uh, murders, if it is important or not important to make that distinction. If I go, uh, and I, I am very, very close, you know, in favor to what uh, General Comment Number 34 that you that you know uh, says in in paragraph 23rd. In that paragraph, of course, uh, it. It was not included uh, in the concept of journalists, some people that are gathering information and distributing information about, for example, human rights violation. But at the end, the UN uh, Human Rights Committee says they deserve the same protection. So for me, that discussion is not that relevant. It's relevant for statistics. It's not that relevant for, for, for when you are talking about impunity, attacks, uh, prevention and so on and so forth. Maybe it's important when you are talking about the protection of sources of journalists. That's another problem, but this is not the problem that we are dealing now. So I, I, I would like to get your, your impression about that. And on universal jurisdiction, I'm, you, you mentioned, Nadim, uh, uh, European countries. And I, I want to know why you mentioned just European countries, because there are examples in Latin American countries as well. And for flu, full, full disclosure, uh, your former colleague and my wife Tamara triggered uh, a case against the perpetrators of Khashoggi assassination in Argentina, and they opened a case in Argentina, and the and the and the the consequence, as far as some people know, was that the prince decided not to stay in a hotel but to stay in the embassy just in case, and not to not to be in the street for many times just in case. So sometimes triggering universal jurisdiction is, is, is important not to get the sentence, not to get the conviction at the end, but to put some pressures to uh, the perpetrator. So my question there is, it will be, when you say, okay, we, we can have this panel to gather a lot of documents, where are we, where we are going to use this, this, this documentation? I think that, it is, and, and I want to hear your opinion about that because you were working in a region of the world that is not Latin America, but uh, what do you think to, I mean, to open the eyes and to open this discussion in other organizations that are not in Europe, but that can be very, very helpful because there are some countries in Latin America that can be very open to uh, apply a universal jurisdiction standard. Thank you, Nadim. Thank you, and it's great to see you again, Eduardo. Um, so I would add, um, so on your first comment, it's true, um, you know, I, I, um, I have, uh, I think similar to what your reasoning, I have a very uh, pragmatic um, and protective approach to the definition of journalism, particularly based on my experience of the last 15 years, where, in most of uh, repressive countries, uh, most people that do the job of what looks like journalism, relaying information to the public, don't tend to be card-carrying journalists because that profession and as independence does not exist in their country. And some of them um, may be journalists, but they're also often human rights defenders because a lot of their journalism is about human rights violations. And um, it can become very tricky at one point to decide, well, at this person in that day, were they acting as a human rights defender or as a journalist when they were interviewing families of disappeared? Uh, 
or when they were reporting on a particularly nasty attack. And I think this is why the functional approach and why a lot of the international documents today talk about journalists and human rights defenders. And obviously, we've all experienced the fact that the, um, a lot of the journalism has now moved online and in different formats, um, including, frankly, uh, Facebook and YouTube as platforms for dissemination that are quick, cheap, and, 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 uh, and available to a wide range of people. So I, I think it's a, it's a, um, that's the best way I can answer um, this question about uh, journalists um, and, in, and, and the definition. Uh, I think the best way is to kind of ground it in some international text, but to take an expansive and protective view that takes into account the realities of the work journalists do on the ground. Um, in, in countries like Syria and other ones. Um, with respect to, and, and this really applies to the local, I would say local journalists, obviously international journalists who find themselves in these countries, that's traditionally much easier to determine. But even there, you know, and I think a lot of journalists would tell you, we've seen the rise of the precarious journalists, the stringers, people who, uh, foreign journalists who travel, and there are many of them in Syria, not necessarily, you know, on assignment, but they go to report and they sell their assignment to different, uh, uh, you know, uh, outlets. And that raises as well, they're very vulnerable because they may not have the protective gear, they don't have the whole support or even the, the training to sufficiently protect themselves. But that's, I think, a conversation for another day, some of the, you know, um, the precariousness of the profession of journalists. Um, on your second question, you are totally right. Um, this is, um, this should not necessarily be limited to Europe. Uh, but here's the challenge we have um, in the uh, Middle East, North Africa region. Unfortunately, um, the regional there are no strong regional mechanisms for accountability, human rights, and frankly, we don't have any regional champions uh, for that. I mean, the Arab Court for Human Rights. There's a reason no one has heard of it. Um, it's uh, unfortunately a terrible institution that doesn't even comply with all the uh, human rights norms and has really, it actually never gets, it never got used. And uh, none of the other Arab countries tend to have uh, um, any sort of jurisdiction. They themselves often being repressive countries that violate their own rights. Uh, my focus has been on Europe really in the context of Syria for two reasons. One, it's because of the large number of uh, Syrian refugees who uh, sought refuge there. And that has, and in that, in those waves of refugees, uh, like has happened in other cases, you also have a few perpetrators that end up trying to dissimulate themselves as refugees. So that has created the only, I would say, uh, real space for potential contribution. Now there have been some cases as well in in, in the U.S., for instance, for Mary Colvin um, in the U.K. Uh, but the, uh, or I mean, for in, also, also for Austin Tice, who's an American journalist who disappeared in Syria. Uh, but I would say these are few and far between. And it's true that your um, argument about, you know, universal jurisdiction cases can act as a deterrent. They can uh, prevent perhaps visits uh, by certain, uh, you know, high ranking uh, Syrian officials. And I think that's, that's important. Um, but at the same time, you know, after 11 years, you can really sense amongst Syrians, there's a real desire for um, actual justice. They want to have their day in court. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, Assad and the senior clique around him, uh, most of them are already sanctioned and wanted for crimes against humanity for, for all sorts of other abuses. So I think we should really try to also explore how to, um, you know, uh, operationalize this thirst for justice to find mechanisms where uh, people can, you know, there can be real prosecutions. Uh, that's not to say that the, the, these these other efforts on universal jurisdiction cases are very important. Maybe we need to expand the strategies beyond uh, the usual countries. There will be some evidentiary uh, challenges uh, and question of resources. You know, if you wanted, if you're mentioning, for instance, uh, South America, if you want to bring cases there, you're going to have to translate uh, a lot of the evidence. You're going to have to put uh, an entire machinery in place. And so far, we haven't always seen the political will of countries to do that. Um, frankly, mostly because they don't want to get some of these witnesses 
uh, to come to their countries because they're also worried they'll have more refugees. I mean, it's very cynical to say that, but unfortunately, I've seen it happen in the past. Question? Yes, Gil, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nadim, for a uh, very succinct and, and learned uh, commentary on, on, the, on our present discontent. Um, I actually agree with you entirely on the question of, of um, what kind of a definition we want. And I, I suppose I agree in part with my fellow judge. Um, but let me say that I think uh, this, the, the definition discussion should not be left for a later time. This is, this is a, I, I, I monitor the killing of lawyers and journalists in the Philippines. We have this discussion all the time. And that discussion is not just amongst the other monitoring groups of which there are three or four with which I disagree mostly, uh, but it's, 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 you know, it's out there in the public and, and, and by the definition, you determine how many murders or attacks of other kinds uh, that can be listed and, you know, it gives you the legitimacy to do so if you have a definition that is justifiable. Um, so having, having said that, uh, I mean, we, we can argue about the definitions and what should go into it, but for this tribunal, I think, it, and, and, and because I think this tribunal is important, what we say is, is, is important. And part of what we say, I would like to think, would be uh, to set up a definition, a broad, inclusive definition, recognizing the, re recognizing the realities on the ground. And so I would ask you, given that you've, 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 you've said that, that the high level panel has discussed this matter, is there a definition that you folks have that we might look at and, and use or comment upon? Is, is, or is it just in the discussion stage? I can go back and check, to be honest, uh, whether in the reports, um, if this was permanently settled or whether we said for the purposes of this report, we are, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, journalists, we are referring to people who are doing X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I think the, in some ways, the way we've tackled recommendations, at least in the report I did um, as well, we felt that the recommendations we were developing around impunity uh, should be expanded to people who would fall more into the human rights defenders, you know, so we ended up, uh, you know, we, we, we dealt with it. I don't know if it was in a footnote or in a paragraph. It's been a while now. We moved on and then we framed our recommendations in a way where, you know, um, if you're not getting paid for doing this, it doesn't mean you don't deserve the protection. Yeah. Um, but I could check and maybe send it to the secretariat if, if there was a definition that we ended up uh, adopting. I know there was a discussion. We, you, you know, we adopted an approach that was the same across the different reports, uh, but I don't recall at this stage if we sort of uh, developed yeah. our own definition that was inclusive of everything. And I know there have been these discussions as well amongst various uh, you know, uh, NGOs working on the protection of journalists, that they've developed it as well for resource reasons. Who do they protect? Who do they intervene on their behalf? Um, and how do they um, do it? I think a definition, in my view, and this is just sort of my opinion, would need to um, be broad enough to kind of capture the different categories. But when we're when it's being applied in the context, it takes into account this context of, uh, sure. you know, sure. because if one of the issues are people just doing it to get paid? Um, you would exclude a lot of people that are doing it to be disseminated, but they're doing it in, in great moments of crisis, yeah. like what was happening in yeah. Syria. Yeah. Well, that, that's fine. I, I, I really appreciate uh, your, your uh, um, willingness to, to assist us in this matter. And, and it might not, if, you know, there might not be a formal definition, but if if you can refer us to some place, some report or document where you deal with the matter in that indirect sort of way, uh, that would be useful too. Sure. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, thank you for uh, what you presented to us.
But as a journalist, can I just throw in one more reason why I think it's really crucial we have this discussion on how we define journalists? Because I think what we haven't discussed is the change in the business models of the media all over the world, mm. maybe not mm. so much in the prosperous countries, but even countries that have a so-called democratic setup, the business model has meant that media houses have pushed out, they have downscaled, they've pushed out journalists who are being compelled now to be freelancers, independent journalists, and therefore they do not have accreditation, even though they write regularly, because this suits the owners of the media houses to have fewer people on their staff and to draw on this whole pool of journalists who are out there looking for work, competing with each other, getting paid very little. And they are the most vulnerable. So, because when they get caught, governments, including the government I mean, in my country, call them alleged journalists because they don't have the accreditation. So I think, in fact, when we are talking about this whole issue of, uh, you know, of the murder of journalists and the, what they go through, it is very important that we do come up with a definition that encompasses this new reality that has come. It is not just an optional thing that somebody decides to be a freelancer. You're pushed into it by the economics of big media. Just on this point, I mean, I, I fully agree. And I think it's definitely a conversation that deserves to be had. And I know most of my journalist friends would fully agree with that. Um, I think there's just a context, I think also in Syria, just keep that in mind. I mean, this is an essential conversation. There's also another context in, in Syria. And I think the case we're considering, Nabil Sherbaji is a good case. I mean, he happened to be a journalist beforehand, but think about a country that was completely closed for decades and then an uprising happens. And the uprising is mostly happening initially in like small towns, rural areas, in the poor suburbs, the working class suburbs of big cities. Uh, the government is not allowing foreign journalists in. So a lot of people became journalists on the spot, so to speak. You know, I mean, they uh, before no one cared about and no one had heard about places like Dara uh, and so forth. And suddenly they become the eyes and ears. And uh, eventually, initially they do it because they just want to tell people what's happening to their neighborhood, to their families. And then many of them uh, became photographers. They would get paid by AFP, AP, and others for these photographs because there were only one there. Uh, so, you know, and and kind of there, there's today an ecosystem of organizations that provide journalistic training, kind of on the go in the conflict zones and so forth. So I I, I fully uh, agree, and I think it's an important discussion. Um, but my only point would be uh, definitions should not become a barrier to protection. That's my only concern, uh, what I wanted to raise that, particularly in contexts like Syria. Um, and I agree that this should not also be a cop-out so that the media industry does not protect journalists uh, and does not do that. So I think we need to kind of just be careful between you know these two boundaries, but I, I fully agree otherwise um, based on our experience in Syria. Um, in your opinion, the war in Ukraine, having Russia as a protagonist, what consequences can have in this effort to bring justice for Syrian journalists? Um, can, can I just make sure I better understand the question? Um, so you mean in terms of vis-a-vis -vis Russia's role as well in Syria, or just globally, yes, whether Syria, this might be international yes, effort? Because Russia was the, is the ally, have this alliance with Syria. Yeah. And I don't know now that we are uh, in this big war, what consequences can have uh, to bring, uh, in these efforts to bring justice for all these journalists? Yeah, that's, a, that's a real good question. And I think even before, um, frankly, the Ukraine conflict, Syria has shown us in a way um, the, um, you know, there's a real accountability gap uh, in international institutions, notably at the UN. And things were already, uh, I would say, blocked at many of the international institutions, be it referrals to the ICC or US. Uh, we're lucky, you know, obviously the U.S. Uh, 
um, I can use the word hatred. The U.S. hates the ICC. Uh, the you know uh, attacks it all the time. Times tries to undermine it. Uh, international powers tend to defend their uh, allies, particularly in MENA. So Russia gives coverage to Syria, US gives coverage to Israel, and, and you know other countries give coverage to Saudi and so forth. Um, and I think what we're seeing now in, in Ukraine is just going to paralyze even more many of these international uh, fora, such as the UN, uh, because we'll, you know, it will be less about principle and more about interest of great powers. And we already saw, even before Ukraine, Russia was already shielding um, Syria. And I can tell you from personal experience in uh, 2015 or 2014, I traveled to Moscow to present to the Russian authorities at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs a report about violations being committed by their allies in Syria in the hope that they could intervene to improve detention facilities, exactly some of the same detention facilities that Nabil Sharbaji was detained in and eventually died from bad treatment in these facilities. And I can tell you, they did not care. And I think they care even less today. Um, and I think this is why one of the recommendations of the high level panel is, if the international system is paralyzed, uh, we need to think about other forms of multilateralism. So, you know, the answer to paralyzed internationalism is not necessarily to go back to unilateralism, but to think and to be creative and think about new forms of uh, internationalized institutions uh, that are not just Western, so that the, in this coalition, you would have countries from different regions that care about these principles and in a way would have their legitimacy, you know, from the fact that it represents uh, you know, a wide variety of countries from different parts of the world that are united in uh, a commitment to principles. I mean, we realize that this is a challenge, but I think um, we need to be uh, creative and to imagine such uh, institutions uh, that can play a role and that can build and, and you know, um, and have credibility. And I think this is particularly important for places like uh, Syria. You know, and we've seen a budding small but increasing architecture develop in, in Europe, in, in Latin America, in many countries, in many other parts of the world to, you know, to kind of at the supranational, but without going all the way to international. But in many places, like in the Middle East, North Africa, we don't have that regional space. And, and therefore, this multilateral effort becomes even uh, more, uh, more important. Thank you. I think that's all from us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadine, for your contribution twice to this effort. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, my, it's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much and uh, best of luck. <laughs>